this is Vivica Williams and you're watching Head to Head. Since the beginning of the war in eastern Ukraine, priests have been accompanying soldiers at the front lines, both Catholic and Orthodox chaplains. To talk more about the role of the chaplain ministry of Ukraine and the conditions of martial law, we welcome to the studio today Father Andrei Zelensky. He's a military chaplain of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Father, thank you for being with us today. So we know that the, um, the, the ministry and the Church of Ukraine has been well involved in uh, events in Ukraine since even when we had uh, Euromaidan up to the support of Ukrainians and, and when it comes to the war in the East. So tell us about the role of chaplains in the war in wartime. Well, the role of a chaplain, of a military chaplain in a war zone is very specific and I would say a very significant role. Since the major scope of a chaplain ministry definitely is to defend what I usually call wounded by war humanity. To defend an inner world, the, the, the most significant part of a soldier, of a warrior, to defend, to defend somebody who has a duty, but at the same time, who plays the sacred role of a defender of his family, of his land, of his country. So the role of the priest is to make sure that wounded by war, humanity stays human. That a person with weapon in his hands remains a human person ready to defend, but at the same time is not being devoured by hatred from, from within. Ready to fight, but at the same time somebody who, who knows exactly what he's doing and one, why he doing, why he is doing what, what he has to do in this very, uh, very stressful context which we call a war. Yes. And you've been uh, on the front lines since, uh, for, for quite a while now. Exactly, since the very beginning. I'm considered to be the first uh, chaplain at the ATO headquarters near Slovyansk, and then later on these were very hot spots such as uh, Pesky, not far away from the Donetsk airport, the Balceva, Avdivska, Promzona, Shirokin, Vodine. So these are all uh, places of major battles, I would say, in the history of this war. And, uh, you know, when I came back for the first time from the war zone, I started to write something later on, it became a book, one of the, of the, of the three books I wrote so far. But the first text, the primary text, was uh, a report from Zone of Authenticity. Mm. And this was a great discovery, to find an authentic value of our humanity in the context where there's so much ideological perplexity, but our soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers uh, had to defend their country, their humanity, at the time when the world was either quiet or when the world was uh, in major perplexity, what's, what's going on in, in that country. So it was very difficult, it seems to me, for them to find a proper sense of, of doing what they were uh, of what they were doing. In some senses of feeling alone exactly. in, in ways, this lonely. Exactly, but sometimes mm -hmm. even there's a threat of being of being not understood, of being uh, judged, just because it took it took quite quite a time for, for the world to uh, to pronounce out loud, to say out loud that there is war, that uh, Russia yes. is an aggressor. So, but meanwhile, we were defending, and I say more than just a land, more than just a country, more than than, than our territory. We are defending something very, very human. We are defending human values, the values upon which the, the, the Western civilization was being, what was built uh, in centuries. So this is human dignity, human rights, liberty, freedom. So all those, uh, I'd say, fundamental principles of the Western civilization. So they were being defended by human lives, by people who paid their own lives, uh, during this war, during the five years of, uh, of the war on the Ukrainian ground. And so you help uh, these soldiers stay human, mm -hmm. which is a very difficult thing um, in cases of war, when, when war in itself is, mm -hmm. is an inhumanity. Uh, what are some of the things or lessons or ways that you help reach out to, to those mm -hmm. who are fighting? 
Well, I would say that one of the most important parts of our ministry, definitely as a priest, I have the Word of God, as a priest, I have um, sacraments to, to, to minister, but one of the most important steps towards a person wounded by war is definitely a capacity to listen to, to open your heart so that a person who is in front of you, head to head, face to face, can open his heart wounded by by violence, wounded by by stress, by unexpected circumstances that usually happen in times of war. So this capacity to listen and to hear. And I remember confessions which I had to listen uh, during fire, during uh, mines exploding all around. I mean, this is all reality. Sometimes, for example, I was, uh, it, it was not far away from the Donetsk airport, but uh, a few guys uh, expressed their desire to, to confess and I had to, to go from one place to another place. At, at that time it was a, a, it was a site of major, of major uh, yeah, and it was like a Hollywood scene uh, today. It's, it's an real. unreal, unreal it feeling. Was very, <laughs> it was, everything was very real. Everything was, was, was very real. Usually, usually I would say that this body has seen so much that one can't even imagine during these five years. And, and tell us about uh, what, what else was going on at that time. So you were saying that you were, were ministering to uh, people. And, and that's something I think a lot of people may not understand when it comes to the role of a chaplain. This is not holding services, uh, you know, behind the front lines during times of peace. You're there right. with, with the soldiers and you've been there in all of these major battles. And what are some of the things that you have You've written three books about that. What are some of these takeaways that you've gotten that can help even not soldiers, with other people to be able to cope in these situations? Right. Uh, definitely as a priest, uh, serving a mass, for example, is one of the priorities, but you can't do this on the front line. So you can do it only when you go back to some safer place. And usually I do this either for Easter, for Christmas or for a Sunday. But the rest of the time, I would usually travel from one position to another position all the way along the line and uh, staying with the guys, living with the guys, but while asking the question. In your question, there was this couple of words which for me expressed the whole uh, essence of military chaplain ministry at the front line, and that is to be with, to be with the soldiers. At the times of, uh, of utter violence sometimes, at the times of fear and stress, uh, to be there, to make sure, and you have to be a person of a joyful character, you have to be a person of great faith and trust in the Lord, so that you can express this joy. Sometimes uh, it's even, it is a part of, of my ministry, it is a part of a ministry of, the, of any military chaplain, to make sure that those whom you serve, get from you, take from you more life mm -hmm. to stay alive. Because for them to stay alive, it's it's part of their it's a part of their job. It's a part right. of defending their country and everybody else who's who, in such situations, definitely depend on them. So uh, it's listening and hearing. It's talking while expressing some hope. It's trying to to wake up something very human that, as a result of uh, an utter violence they have to experience, is hidden somewhere deep inside, to bring that human person and to secure their spiritual development, even there at the front line. I would usually ask guys to, to make goals for a day, physical training, uh, emotional uh, goals, some, some intellectuals, I would give them to read some books, I mean, easy things, but uh, to make sure that they stay human, that they stay alive, that they can, this is the only, uh, this is the only condition when they can do what they're supposed to do. And how do you take care of yourself? Because to be able to have all of these things to give, you must uh, have to take care of yourself and, as well. Yes, exactly. I, I do exactly this, the same things I suggest uh, my friends, my, 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 my military friends to do, and that is, to communicate, I usually say that there is no more effective way of uh, inner healing than communication, than being that, that conversation, chatting, but uh, sometimes of a high quality, I would say, which is sometimes emotional, sometimes very meaningful, but chatting, being able to, to express your most hidden, let's say, sometimes fears, distresses, uh, and that's very important. 
and also reading. But one of the, let's say, the methods I experience, one, a part of my discipline, is writing. I write. I would write to post to Facebook. Uh, I would it's write the books for, yeah. exactly. But while you try to write, while you try to express yourself, you try to objectivize your the the parts. I would say wounded by war, and then you find that there is still so much more in you than the wounded part of your personality. And to find that other part, it's very important because this is from where you you take uh, resource to share with others and that's how you know also how to heal others, how to help them find their not wounded uh, integral parts. Yeah, this is very essential, is, yes. is helping people separate themselves it from is. and maintain themselves from whatever condition or, or situation they're in. It is, yeah. absolutely. And what have you seen, what changes have you seen uh, over the last uh, four, uh, going on five years of yeah. war? Well, I would usually divide the, the whole war period into three periods. And the first one is definitely characterized by a great uh, degree of uncertainty, but also a high degree of motivation. So, uh, and, and it is a very dangerous context, the uncertainty which usually, which as a result can produce uh, all the post-traumatic syndrome disorders. So uh, when it's, it's chaos, so to say, but still there is a will to do what you're supposed to do, to defend even when you don't have enough, uh, enough stuff that, that you, people well, in the situation like this usually would have, right? Right. Well, this is definitely the beginning of the war. Absolutely. Right? Then so. the second period when the draft started, so usually we have in the army in such situation, the, it's like um, the essential, not only potential, but also problems that usually exist in the society, they reflect themselves in the, in the army like this. So during the, all the, you know, the waves, draft waves. And then we arrived at a certain point, we arrived uh, at the, to the level, as I usually say, the, the professional army. So mm -hmm. as for today, there are only professional military who are present and uh, doing their duty in the war zone. And this is a completely different reality. So they're being trained sufficiently, they're being prepared, they, they do it because they want to do this in the sense that they, they do it willingly and uh, consciously. And it helps uh, a lot, with especially psychological Absolutely. threats, right? Absolutely. And it helps a lot because they're, they're professional soldiers, they're warriors of their, of their people, they're there to defend their people, to defend their country, and they know it, and it helps a lot. And uh, one last question, well, not quite a question. Um, you were awarded the uh, was the you National Hero of Ukraine Award in 2015, and what did you find? I know so many people, especially someone in your condition, who's awarded something. Uh, this this is not the reason why you're doing this work that you're doing. Absolutely. When somebody asks me what are your fears, what are the major fears, I would usually say that uh, superficiality and awards. I don't like awards uh, and I don't like uh, titles. Titles make you make you do or make you act in the way the scenario proposes. So if you're a hero or somebody else, so you, you'd you start to play a hero. So a real hero is, the, is somebody who is doing his job just because he knows he has to do this and who is not paying attention to any titles or any awards. And that's the important thing. In my case, I'm a priest. I have a vocation and I have to do what I have to do to help my friends, my guys to stay alive, to stay human, That's despite everything. Absolutely, I guess what, the, what it should be meant by a hero, or these are quiet heroes in a way, of people who just, they do what needs to be done. And uh, after today, after your time here in Kiev, where will you go next? Well, I still have more responsibilities. Uh, nowadays, I'm responsible for the chaplain service in the Ukrainian armed forces on behalf of my church. So, which means it's a different level. Now I have to organize the service as such. It's not just my, my personal duty now, but to help other priests to stay also helpful for their guys. So it's uh, sometime in Kyiv and then going back to see how my guys are doing there. Thank you so much for being with us today, Father. Thank you for the invitation. That was Father Andrei Zelinsky, a military chaplain with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Thank you for watching UATV and please stay tuned for more.